Eidolon is a vibrant star and home to all manner of life and terrain. Amid cerulean seas and azure skies lay five great landmasses, two oceans, and a myriad of seas, rivers, and islands. The three great continents, so named not for their size, but sheerly for their familiarity, are Aldenard, Ilsebard, and Othard. And the other two continents are their distant sisters of Mericidia and the New World. For the greatest bodies of water, there is the westerly Indigo Deep and the easterly Glass Ocean. To understand Heidelin's peoples and their histories, is to understand the very lands and waters of the star itself. And so here, we present a primer on all such things. Before we begin, it should be remembered that a map of the realm is an indispensable tool of any traveler. And mass access to effective ones has only existed for less than a century. As our knowledge of Heidelin's geography expands, so too do the borders of such charts. For all the exploration of adventurers and the knowledge of Charlayne, even the three great continents we are most familiar with often remain shrouded in the fog of uncertain borders. And what we do know may be inaccurate, to say the least. It is the legacy of perseverance and respect for the power of cartography that has seen us to these shores, literally and figuratively and future days will assuredly see exploration and the charting of new frontiers. And lest we forget the effort of those who make them, we should commit to memory that a map is only as precise as the moms walked in her making. Another important tangent though, the term star in common parlance is a term used to refer to celestial bodies, both solar, like the sun, and terrestrial, like Heidelin herself. This can be seen in an example with the likes of the Dragon Star, the heavenly body from which dragons come from, and from which Ishgardian astrologers chart the course of dragonkind. And despite its brilliance in the night sky, it is in actuality very much a terrestrial planet, and not like our sun. So what of the continents, then? The five continents of Heidelin, varied as each one is, are geographic marvels in their wide and spanning biomes and geographies. Our first continent is that of Aldenard, the primary landmass that makes up Eorzea. Eorzea itself actually being more of a geopolitical region than a geographic one, as it's made up of the nations of Aldenard and its large western island of Vilbrun. Aldenard is home to arid deserts, verdant forests, snow-covered mountains, and more and can broadly be split into six major regions. The desert of Thanalin, the forests of the Black Shroud, the mountainous valleys of Kurthis, the lush terrain of Dravanya, the rocky landscapes of Girabanya, and the crystal blasted lands of Mordona. Never is reality so simple though, and many other regions exist, including the Amalja home of Pagalfon in the south, and Zelfatol, the home of the Ixil in Abalathia's spine a mountain range running from east to west across Aldenard's north, with the skull of the mountain range residing in the locks of Girabanya and its tail in the hinterlands of Dravanya. First of our regions is Thanalin, located on the southernmost edge of Aldenard. Thanalin's topography is mostly to be expected for a desert and dryland area, with large swaths of sands, especially in the Sigoli Desert and Thanalin's southern expanse, but also with regions of rocky hills and small mountains throughout. Though its harsh sun can be unkind and water a scarcity, flora and fauna still abound here. Its borders mostly bounded by seas, it is an irony then that the land is, while beautiful, all too often water-starved. It is, however, mineral-rich, both in ore found beneath the land and with large fields of cerulean found in the north. Thanalin houses a legacy of hardy people, from antiquity to Belladea, whose ruins abound within the desert, and even onto the Ulda of today. With Pagalthon to its east, the homeland of Amalja, wherefrom many groups find their way into Thanalin, and Mordona to its north, as well as Linosia to its west, it is not an isolated region, 
and is a major source of commercial wealth. The western shore of Thanalin, with its ready access to the Strait of Merlthor, means it is the most ready trading partner of Limsa Liminsa, further providing for mercantile endeavors and allowing the desert flower of Ulda to bloom. As with all of Eorzea, there are more than a few regions of Thanalin that have been left marred by the fall of Dalamud and the rending of the land by Bahamut. Most grievously is the Eastern Burning Wall, now a vast swath of overaspected crystal and mechanical elegant remnants. In contrast to the scorching landscape of Thanalin is the verdant forests of the Black Shroud, home to Gridania and the vestiges of ancient Gelmora and Amdapur. With a cool and mild climate, and access to ready sun and rain, the plant life of the forest grows in abundance, and the very land teems with aether. Located in the central northeast of Aldenard, the topography of the Shroud is predominantly woodland and forest. Its eastern edge is a dense thicket of leaf and plant, and populated by the Sylph of the Sylphlands. Its northern region, bordering both Curthis and Zelfatol, is more open, and plays staging ground for Exali raiders, and where nearby lays a large chunk of Dalamud, which utterly devastated the land around it. To the far south lays the ancient ruins of Amdapur, and the original home of white magics. The Black Shroud's thriving landscape, however, belies much danger, both from the natural and unnatural world, and the elemental spirits that are the very soul of the forest often further this peril. While those of Gridania, do all they can to maintain positive relations with these ethereal and corporeal denizens of the wood. Occupying the north-central part of Aldenard and placed amongst the body of Abilathia's spine, Curthis is a frozen and alpine landscape. Its lands were once both chilling and mountainous, but predominantly valleys of green pastures. The seventh umbral calamity saw a climate shift for Curthis, and now its once vibrant fields are as its snow-blasted mountains, causing a rapid need for adaptation to a new way of life for both the men and beast that live there. To its west and south are its highlands, adjoining Curthis to Dravania and the Black Shroud, respectively. To its north and east lay Abilathia's spine and the marvel of the Sea of Clouds, islands of earth floating in the sky the naturally forming wind aspected crystals, and home to the Vanu Vanu, as well as tales of lost floating cities in the sky. Curthis is home to the Holy Sea of Ishgard. The people of its lands have known a sordid history of peace and war, most often sourced in their relationship with their scaled neighbors to the west. To the west of Curthis lies the dragon populated Dravanya, marking the tail end of Abilathia's spine. This region is home to all sorts beyond dragonkind, though. Its forelands hold large forests that play home to Chocobo, small towns, and the Nath. Unlike Curthis, it is relatively barren of snow. Its mountains, with summits hiding beyond the clouds, are hidden in churning mists that obfuscate structures and secrets of Eld. And its surrounding lands hold large and fertile dales, cut with river and plant life. To the north lays the Far Reach, home of the Hellsguard Rogadin, and beyond that, the Bloodbrine Sea. Dravania's most western region, the Dravanian Hinterlands, plays home to the ruins of Charlayan's former outpost on Eorzea, which was abandoned over 15 years ago. It is often referred to as New Charlayan, and which now houses a coterie of goblins in their cobbled together town of Idleshire. The lands of Dravania were spared the geological and geographic shifts of the Seventh Umbral Calamity, and most, if not all, its consequences, as it was shielded by its relative isolation. To its south lays the island of Vildbrand, and on Dravania's westernmost shore lies the beginning of the Indigo Deep, a vast ocean that rests between Aldenard and the New World. On the opposite edge of Aldenard, in its easternmost region, lies the highlands of Gir Abanya. With the forest of the Black Shroud to its west, just across Baelsar's wall, the dense vegetation quickly fades into the craggy hills of the Gir Abanya fringes, which is bisected north to south by the Velodyna River. 
Secreted away in its foothills is Ralgar's Reach, an ancient training ground for monks and worshippers of Ralgar. With the fringes being the breeding ground of the Ananta and home to the M. Makote tribe, life flourishes even in this rocky region. Eastward, falling Abalathia's spine, do we find the region known as the Peaks. The land is hard and poor for farming, but life and beauty persists regardless. On Girabanya's easternmost edge rests the city-state of Alamigo, amongst the salt flats of the loch, and the very skull of Abalathia's spine. Crossing between sun and clouded thunderstorms, the weather of Girabanya matches the worship of its people, in Ralgar, the destroyer, and his mastery over lightning. Turning to Girabanya's south lies the Sea of Jade, and to its east, due to the etheric regularities in the climate, the ever-shadow-shrouded region of the Gimlet Dark, the final barrier between Aldenard and Ilsebard. In the very heart of the continent lies Mordona and the Lake of Silvertier. Once a prosperous region full of grass and greenery, a battle between Midgardsormer and the 14th Legion of Garlemald saw an explosion of aether that rent the land transforming large swaths into crystal-laden wastes. Housing secrets of Alag, installations of Garlemald, the grave of the eldest dragon, and a village devoted to hope, it is a land acting as a confluence of Aether, and of old scars, and new life. From the changes in the land brought about by the Seventh Umbral Calamity, has the Crystal Tower, an ancient structure of Alag, risen from the ground. And in recent days, much and more has been devoted to the study of Alag in and around Mordona, not least of which by the scholars of St. Koinax Fine. Bordered on all sides by nation-states and rivers, it is a ground of some neutrality, though the Cardinal Flats, location of Dalamud's descent and final battle of the Sixth Astral Era to its southeast, are hotly contested for the priceless Alagan secrets they contain. To Mordona's due east lays the Yafame Saltmoor, an inhospitable salt marsh which houses the ruin of ancient Mach, one of many civilizations lost to the Sixth Umbral Calamity, a worldwide flood, and home to the originators of black magic. And further still, just past the Strait of Merlthor, lays the Isle of Vilbrand. Vilbrand, island neighbor to Aldenard and second puzzle piece to the collective of Eorzea, is made up of two geographic regions, Lenosia to the south and Ogomoro to the north, bisected by a titanic volcano sharing its name with the northern region of the island. Surrounded by water, which plays a vital role in its people's life and culture, to Vilbrin's south lays the Rotano Sea and the Sildales Archipelago. To its west churns the Indigo Deep, and to its north and east is the Strait of Merlthor acting as an easy gateway to the mainland continent. The region of Lenosia is a veritable paradise, with hilly plains running up and down its coastline. Its eastern region is so pleasant, it plays host to a beach resort. The city-state of Limsa Liminsa acts as its hub of life and commerce, and the bonds of its people to the sea are absolute. This, and its history of pirate culture, rooted in the founding Seawolf Rogadin, has caused an uneasy peace upon the banning of such practices. But the permission for piratry against Garlean ships has done much to forestall any reckoning. For all its sunshine and fair weather, though, are reminders of past tragedies and current dangers. Dense jungle and savage wildlife mire much of the island. Scars of the Calamity linger, as does the presence of Garlemald. On the western coast lay groups of Sahagan, the westerly indigo deep acting as their native home, and to the north rest the ruins of ancient Nim, who shared its fate with Mach, and whose Nimians were the progenitors for the scholar school of magic, and colonies of industrious kobolds who mined tunnels around the outlying region of their mountain home. Even further north is Ogomoro, the home of all kobolds. Its dense, untouched jungles and expansive waterfalls are a rare and beautiful sight, marked as a place out of time. 
with few who can have said to have explored its many wonders. From Aldenard and Vilbrand, we look eastward past the Gimlet Dark and across the Sea of Jade to the continent of Ilsebard. Divided in twain by a vast mountain range through the continent's heart, with snowy wastes to the north and temperate fields to the south. Though all lands have known conflict through their histories, it is of recent years that Ilsebard has seen more than its fair share of chaos and cruelty. Controlled by the Garlean Empire for decades, and thus limiting easy travel amongst its expanse, it is hard to catalog its geography in detail. But through the knowledge of natives and experienced boots on the ground, we can attempt an accurate picture of its reaches. Blasted by snow and lightning, at one of the northernmost points of Hydaelyn, resting in the glacier of the Magna Glacius, cold and unforgiving, the glacial plains of Garlemald are near inhospitable wastes of ice and snow. The people of this land, forced from their ancestral home in southern Ilsebard, struggled for their very survival, until upon the discovery of rich ceruleum fields, developed technologies powered by the blue gaseous liquid. Allowing them to become an unrivaled power on the continent through the develop of advanced technologies, and providing also for comfortable living, even in such an inhospitable climate. To the west lies the seas of the Northern Empty. To its north and east are lands unknown, but a little further beyond lays the Blind Frost, an expanse of water perpetually choked by drifting ice flows. South of Garlemald lies the dividing mountain range of Ilsebard and the Kingdom of Nalmask. Further still lies the marshy coastland of the continent and the Bounty, a sea of near endless fish and life. The land that the proto garlians fled from, to them known as Locus Omenos, and today known as Corvos, is situated on the southeastern coast of Ilsebard, due north from Thavnir, across the Corvos Narrows, and west of Boja. An enviably fertile land with a warm and temperate climate, its position surrounded by those who would lay claim to it eventually became untenable, leading to the mass exodus of the proto garlians and the rise of the Corvosi people there. Only for Garlemald to return in force 800 years later, to subjugate the descendants of their invaders. On its banks sits the Anchorite, an enormous right foot, with legends speaking of a left foot on Thabnerian shores, and a giant colossus that spanned the Corvos Narrows. What befell the colossus? Be it from time-worn ravages or intentional sabotage, none are left who can say. To Corvos's east and straddling the line between Othard and Ilsebard lies Boja, a once proud nation and productive region laid low by Garlean invasion and occupation. Its once sprawling cities, due to a cataclysmic event 15 years ago, in 1562 of the Sixth Astral Era, are no more. The event was a surge of energy that sent a blast of aether out from the capital, which became a barren waste of debris and vaporized buildings. An overcast sky of dark cloud that perpetually lingers is an oppressive reminder of this event, now called the Bojan Incident. In Boja's far reaches sits Zadnor. Like much of Boja, it was once a rolling plain, but during the fourth Umbral Calamity, some 5,000 years ago, when the world was racked with fierce earthquakes, Zadnor was left a tumult of plateaus and rock, leaving the land heavily earth-aspected. Miners prospecting the earth for all its crystals and ore left it a husk, and after the Bojan Incident's etheric explosion, much of the landscape became etherically charged, causing large boulders and formations to float in the sky. Returning across the continent to its western edge, butting up against the Gimlet Dark and the Sea of Jade, is Whirlit. Home to the start of the Ilsebardian mountain range, and therefore mountainous, Whirlit is home to plains and sparse forestry as well. Its western edge's proximity to the Gimlet Dark leaves a dusk-like imprint over its western sky. Its southern reaches are beautiful cliffside shoreline, but as with Boja, 
where it has suffered much in the past two decades under the assault and subjugation from the Garlean Empire. Perhaps the rains of the land might help to wash away the past and renew Whirlit and her people. To Whirlit's east, we travel across the bounty to the tropical island of Thavnir, home to Razat Han, an independent nation that has maintained its autonomy through fierce neutrality. Thavnir is a land of vibrant peoples, colors, and nature. Dense tropical jungle vegetation grows wild and unchecked across wide swaths of Thavnir's inland region, and pools of water and falls are common sights across its main island. Amongst its trees can be found the time-worn shrines and temples to the worship deities of the people. Its coastline, bordering on the bounty, teems with aquatic life that acts as a large source of sustenance and trade. Not simply lively in its soil, the city of Razat Han is a bustling town of fragrant incense, acrid smoke, and one of the grandest bazaars in the world. Famed for its dancers and alchemy, perhaps Thavnir's most valuable resource is Giant's Gall, a distinctive violet-hued stone with exceptional strength and etheric channeling abilities. The beauty of the towering monolith, crushed into the side of a hill, is something few forget. To the north of Thavnir sits the Corvos Narrows, to its far south, the Siren Song Sea, and the secretive island of Uznair, an island owned by wealthy alchemists who restrict its access. And to its east, the last of the three great continents, the far eastern Othar. A quick note on the notions of Near East and Far East. Though you will hear the terms often, their meanings can be a bit hard to pin down. In a strict sense, the Far East is defined as regions belonging to Othard, and Near East has predominantly been used in reference to Thavnir, and on occasion, mainland parts of Ilsevar. But these terms are loose and are meant to be used descriptively, not prescriptively. With that clarified, let us continue. Furthest east of the continents and bordering the glass ocean lies Othard. A land of expansive steppes, wet farmland, rainless deserts, long mountain ranges, dense jungle, and even a lifeless waste. Its peoples, with multiple storied legacies, have, as with so many others, suffered under Garlean occupation. But the bounty of its lands matches the strength of its people's spirit, ever allowing for a new dawn. Furthest east of Othard, is the volcanic archipelago of Hingashi. Made up predominantly of two islands, Koshu, the larger of the two, and Shishu, the smaller, with the Rasen Kaikyo dividing them. Bounded on all sides by the glass ocean, save for its western edge, which sits against the Ruby Sea, its nation is fiercely independent and isolationist, only allowing foreigners into its port city of Kugane on the smaller island of Shishu, while it is ruled from the capital of Bukyo on the island of Koshu. Koshu has a warm climate with plentiful water and due to rich volcanic soil, bountiful agriculture and industry. Its tallest peak, Mount Dai Tenzan, or Great Heavenly Mountain, rises from the center of the island. Its size and unmelting snow-capped peaks are a majestic symbol and act as a focus of fine art and religious belief for the people of Hingashi. Shishu, while existing in a similar vein, acts as a buffer between Hingashi and the rest of the world. To the west, across the Ruby Sea, lies Yangsha, the home of Dolma. The region is defined by its plains, valleys, and most importantly, by the One River. Since ancient times, its people have built their homes along its fertile shores, and much like with Corvos, this became grounds for conflict amongst the Yangshan people. To the north lies the Bay of Yangsha, and to the south, the region of Nagsha. Plains, hills, and basins all mark the route along the One River, which snakes its way through Yangsha, from its source in the tail mountains of north-central Othar, all the way to the delta that feeds into the Ruby Sea. With plentiful rain and humidity, and fertile lands, it was inevitable that a kingdom such as Dolma would arise. Its castle, situated amongst the One River, 
and defended by the natural cliffs in the Dairyu Moongate. The majesty of its natural surroundings is matched in what was wrought by the hands of man. The eastern banks of the One River are where Doma and the Azim Steppe are found, but on its western banks is the Fanged Crescent, the serpentine head of the Tail Mountains, from whose peaks the Yol of the Zela comes. The Azim Steppe, then, is a vast plains of northern Othar, and plays home to the many Zela tribes of the Aura, as well as one of the homes of the Namazu. Named for their dawn father, Azim, the steppe's rolling fields of grass are broken only by the deep canyon of the Wu, one of many tributaries to the One River. To the south and west lies the Nahama, a desert region named for the Zela's Dusk Mother, bleak and inhospitable even by the hardy Zela standards. There are, however, still some few rivers that run its course and into the One River. To the east is the Bay of Yangsha, and the Rakuri Peninsula, a realm of such inhospitable cold that the ice that flows in from the blind frost to the north remains intact even upon reaching its shore. Due north of the steppe and connected to the peninsula is the Aras, a coastal region of unbroken sheer cliffs, a region so bitterly chilled that its very ocean shore freezes over completely each season. One step further into the far north, is the blind frost, a sea choked in ice flows and hammered by violent storms. No known safe passage exists through these waters, but whispers abound of islands of treasure beyond its impassable gnashing currents. Northwest of the steppe and over the tail mountain, in the cruel regions between Othard and Ilsebard, lies the Devalin Grath, a land of blinding white tundra, a wasteland where even the most hardy of life counts itself blessed to survive each passing moon. To the west is the Unpromised, an island of tragic tales, of leaders foregoing their subjects for greed, and the Knowing Sea. A sea so named for its seeming appearance at the edge of the known world. Its currents made up of the ice and flows from the blind frost and the terrible gales of the burn that blow in from the south. Trailing the Tail Mountains from north to south, we reach Othard's southern region of Nagsha. Known for dense jungles, heat, and humidity, its subtropical climate draws in the moist winds of the glass ocean. These winds mix with the cool air of the westward Skade mountain range, creating billowing vapor clouds, resulting in constant rains year-round. This leaves the land marshy and ill-suited for farming, its peoples, despite a lack of historic accomplishment, have a world and culture all their own. As we travel south, we reach the eastern half of Dalmasca, known to the Garleans as Dalmasca Inferior. Its fertile lands play host to the Golmore jungle, home to the Rava clan of the Viera, and the Zershale River, which separates the south of Othard, on whose banks rests the time-worn Orbone Monastery. Moving east across the Zershale, we arrive in the deserts of Dalmasca and Greylix Bend, the southernmost tip of Othard, with jagged shorelines and coastal reefs. To the north is the Dalmascan Desert, comprising most of Dalmasca Superior, and so vast it is divided into the eastern Easter Sand and the western Wester Sand. Further north lies Rabinaster, the once proud and ancient capital city of Dalmasca now a smoking ruin in the wake of a failed uprising. Nearby is situated the Skade mountain range, home to the Vina clan of the Viera, a wall of precipitous mountains beginning in Othard's east and tailing all the way into Ilsebard, helping to shield Dalmasca and other regions from the desolate winds and wastes of the Burn. The Burn, a land of ashen death, absent of aether and from nearly any meaningful life. Endless dunes of bone-white sand, caused by repeated primal summonings leaching the land of its aether. And as waters and plants withered away, a cascade of death followed. Now all that remains is a dry landscape of wind and ash, a cautious reminder of what power can cost. 
hidden away in its tempestuous dunes and winds, perhaps lie secrets as yet unknown. And so comes to a close those lands that we know most about. And now we begin to venture into seas that, if charted at all, have not been completely so for thousands of years. We now explore what we know of Maricidia and the New World. A large island situated far south of Thavnair, past the equatorial belt, Maricidia's history is tragic, and its lands torn apart by war have still not recovered to this day. Five millennia ago, at the close of the Third Astral Era, the Allegan Empire sought to complete its goal of world domination and began its invasion of Maricidia. Though its people and their guardian deities Bahamut and Tiamat fought with all they had, even going so far as to summon the primals that would become the Warring Triad. They could not stem the tide of Alag. The invasion would end with nearly an entire continent being rendered desolate. While some areas remain uninhabitable even today, those which have been repopulated remain reclusive and very rarely welcome contact with civilizations outside of their own, attacking nearly all who approach making any foray into Maricidia hazardous at best. Because of this, and the inherent cost to venture so far south, very little of the region is known, including even the most basic of geographical information. Though as an exception, and singularly amongst those of the three great continents, those of Thavnir have been known to partake in trade with the Maricidian people. The final of Hydaelyn's great landmasses, the New World, lies far west of Eorzea, past the Indigo Deep, is home to blue magic and many tribes of people. Despite tales of its existence, the New World was only verifiably located by those of the West 80 years ago. In 1499 of the Sixth Astral Era, a sea wolf adventurer from Limsa Laminsa, named Kenanram the Blue, followed ancient tales and came upon the region by sailing west for two moons straight. While Kenan Ram attempted to have Kenan Lam adopted as its title, the New World is the moniker that has stuck into modernity. Despite active trade between Limsa Laminsa and those of the far western continent, most of Eorzea at large are ignorant of anything to do with the New World, save its name, which even in itself is a display of ignorance. Despite this, however, it has been of vital importance, with the native Memel Ja and the Hurian tribes like the Wallaqui, responsible for many modern Eorzean foodstuffs like the Popoto, ogre pumpkins, ruby tomatoes, and alligator pears, all finding their way to our shores. Famed for locales such as the Lapis Canyons, which glow blue with the light of Ceruleum, and whispers of cities of gold, the raw natural wonders of the New World entice adventurers and entrepreneurs alike. Though it is not a world untouched by outside influence, it is still a frontier of wondrous knowledge, and open to adventure for some, and ripe exploitation by others. Moving on though, invariably touched on throughout this primer, the oceans, seas, lakes, and rivers of Hydaelyn are her lifeblood, carrying precious water and acting as the means by which most throughout history have traveled the world. Even with the advent of airships in modern times, the seas remain the most common method by which people travel throughout the star. Closest to home and connecting the west of Eorzea to the distant eastern shore of the New World is the Indigo Deep. Named for its hue and its denizens, it is the ancestral home to the Sahagan. Its briny depths, an enormous and fathomless body of water. Though only a scant few have crossed it over the years, it wasn't until 20 years ago, in 1555 of the Sixth Astral Era, when Merlib Blufusvin, current Admiral of Limsa Laminsa, began a successful voyage to chart a course of safe passage through the Indigo Deep, from Vilbrun to the New World. Its entire expanse is unknown, stretching far north and south of Eorzea, melding with the northern empty, and it may even travel so far around the star that it meets and merges with the glass ocean of the Far East. East across the three great continents, 
laying past and around Othard and Hingashi, is the Glass Ocean. As like to the Indigo Deep, the Glass Ocean is an enormous expanse of water, likely connecting Othard's east banks to the New World's western ones. So named for the way its calm waters glint and shimmer in the sun, to the north lies the Blind Frost, and its southern borders are uncharted, likely extending as far as Maricidia and beyond. Despite its famed tranquility, it is known to suffer from seasonal typhoons of such scale that they are likened to the rage of the Kami themselves. In reference to smaller bodies of water, it is perhaps best to start with the five seas of Eorzea, primarily controlled and protected by Limsa Laminsa. Somewhat erroneously, of these five, the Indigo Deep is one. Of the other four, then, the first is the Rotano Sea, which lies to the south of Vilbrand and west of Thanalin. Filled to the brim with life and ships, its waters flood into the Merlthor Strait, which spans the distance between Vilbrand and Aldenard. Much like all the waters south of the three great continents, what lies past its borders is, for the most part, literal uncharted waters. But the lands of the South Sea Islands do lay somewhere within, native home to the Lalafell, whose denizens have active trade with Vilbrand. The second sea, the Sea of Ash, borders Thanalin's southeast. To its north is the Sea of Jade, and to its eastern edge borders the Drown, a treacherous region of storms and violent tides. Due to the dangers of the Drown, it has been home to many a sunken ship, and the resultant ghosts of their crew. Etheric phantoms, set adrift by strong emotional ties, are a common sight. Despite this danger, it is often preferred over dealing with Garlean naval ships, which are likely to sink a vessel first and seek answers later. The third sea is the Sea of Jade. Its warm waters and pleasant tides are due to its connection with the bounty to its east. The Sea of Jade runs against Aldenar's eastern edge and flows into Rothlet Sound, which feeds into much of the waters of the Black Shroud. Home to many islands, the most famous is Cape Meat, which lies between the Sea of Jade and the Bounty. The Cape is so named with an archaic word for dream, due to a humorous series of events over 500 years ago, in 912 of the Sixth Astral Era, which had an explorer declare his discovery of a route to the island of Hingashi upon a landing what was to become Cape Meat. This error prompted people to immortalize such a foolish mistake with an appropriately lofty name. At last we come to the fourth sea, encompassing Aldenard's north premise, the Blood Brine Sea, spanning from one end of Abalathia to the other, and touching both the Indigo Deep and the western shores of Ilsebard. The Blood Brine Sea is an occasionally cold and tumultuous, but not inhospitable body of water, with many island chains throughout. It was during the Fifth Umbral Era, during the Age of Eternal Frost, that the Bloodbrine Sea froze solid, and the Mikote who had been exiled from Eorzea by ancient Alag at last returned via this new land bridge. To its north lies the Northern Empty, a vast body of water almost entirely void of islands, save for two major exceptions. The first and northernmost is a remote archipelago known as Erslaint, the ancestral home of the seawolf Rogadin, from which the founders of Limsa Lominsa came. Its waters mark the very edge of the northernmost tip of the world. The second group of islands, northwest of Aldenard, is Charlayan, known to those of Eorzea as Old Charlayan, a nation of scholars and academics devoted to knowledge, but also famed for their isolationism. Its main island shares its name with its city-state, while to the north is the Isle of Ham, and to the south, the Isle of Yorn. To its east, once laid the Isle of Val. However, in recent days, the island has vanished with its students, without a trace. Eastward of the Northern Empty, where unknown waters pass Ilsebard and cross over into Othard, is the Blind Frost. Spanning Othard's northern shoreline, the Blind Frost is forever choked in ice and storms, and with no known safe routes of traversal. Of Othard's inner waters, there are the before-mentioned Knowing Sea and the Bay of Yangsha, but most famous is the Ruby Sea. Officially known as the Ruby Tide, 
Its waters turn crimson in the light of the morning sun, granting it its name. Sitting between Othard and Hingashi, and running the length of Othard's eastern shore, it is brimming with sea life. Seasonal tides bring fresh food sources for its creatures, begetting not only many kinds, but great sizes of aquatic life. Home to the Koji, it holds volcanoes, undersea cities, pristine beaches, and more wonders to the eye. Last of the known seas are those of the southern regions, most famous of them being the Bounty. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, the Bounty is named for its abundance of edible aquatic life, resulting in the prosperity of nearly all nations that lay within its bounds. The island of Thavnair and Corvos of Ilsebard, to name a few. To its north lays Ilsebard, to its east the Corvos Narrows, as well as the tail end of Othard, and to the west the Sea of Jade. To its south, however, sits the Siren Song Sea. Believed to be the domain of sirens, it is seen as a cursed place with constant fog and churning waters, a perfect place to hide the unwanted. At some point in the past, Razat Han built a prison on the shores of one of its islands, only to abandon its use later on, leaving a decrepit but perhaps not entirely empty ruin behind. Of late, there are many mentions and whispers of ruins of great civilizations deep beneath the waters of the Bounty, though none have managed to find their exact placement or depth. And so with that, our primer comes to an end. From here, we can begin to dive more in depth with everywhere I've spoke of and beyond in the future. And yet, there is one final thing to mention. Though not of this star, there is one more geographic location that plays into the hearts and minds of all who stare into the night sky. The Sea of Stars, the endless diamond expanse of the heavens, is a source of wonder, terror, and awe. Our own moon sits in its breath, as do the Dragon Star and many more heavenly bodies. Are all those who shine simply like our sun? Does not the Dragon Star prove that perhaps there are more stars out there like our home. For now, there is little we can say or do to know. But perhaps one day, just as we've explored the expansive lands and shores of our own highland, we might discover new truths, and so too journey out on an adventure across the night sky. This content was brought to you by the Aorzean Archives. If you enjoyed this video, help us please the 12 by leaving a like and subscribing for new content every Thursday, and comment down below with any topic you'd like to see our Archons cover in the future. For even more content, discussion, and exclusives, please check out our Discord and consider supporting us on Patreon.